the 150 years of history of Chinese immigrant churches, they just keep on repeating the cycle, right? This church is right. made of immigrants, you know, to create the culture and the church for immigrants. They lose the next generation. Then there's a new generation of immigrants and they just keep on repeating the cycle. We have to do something different mm. in order to minister to the next generation so that the next generation can be empowered and have a platform to minister to the, even the next generation. And so that's why we're making this transition right now, which has been literally a six year process literally lots and lots of steps, literally lots and lots of cultural conflict, hard conversations. We're finally here at this kind of last step. I hope that we're going to be able to set a model be able to like help other immigrant churches to not repeat the cycle with the silent exodus. So that's our hope. That's our vision. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. In today's episode, our host, Jay Pathak, National Director for Vineyard USA, talks to Dennis Liu. Dennis is the leader of the Asian American Association for Vineyard USA and newly installed lead pastor of Vineyard of Hope in Walnut, California. Let's listen in. Dennis, thanks for joining me on our podcast. Oh, it's such a blessing to be here. I uh, know. I well, and by the way, I do think that in the little "We Are Vineyard" thing at the beginning, where we do the "We Are Vineyard," is your vo- your voice is one of the voices, isn't it? That's right. Yep. <laughs> so, so I've, I've actually been on every single episode. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> You've been in every single one, then, because you are one of the "We Are Vineyards," which is yeah. pretty cool. And I've listened it's to pretty- every single episode, Jay. It's been just wonderful. And, okay, uh, so so before we start, then tell me what it, it might be hard to decide, but what's been your favorite one we've done? What's been the most memorable or impactful? Well, I wanted to say, Jay, I don't think you look a day over fifty years old. <laughs> I don't care what Dave Ferguson says, <laughs> dude. I, yeah. I thought you were going to say that. Isn't that the best? That is so funny. Well, when I saw him, you know, I got to be with him again after that. So I saw him. First thing he says, he's like, hey, man, you don't look any older than the last time I saw you. Like, it, it had stayed with him that whole time. That's what was so funny. But anyway, so you like that. That's good. That's good. They were all a blessing. I would say, you know, Ruben Katero is my good friend. And I, mm. I you know, I, I know him really well. But right. I heard even more of his story. Yeah. And just respect him even more. And just oh. actually really grateful for the connection that I personally have with him and our church has with him. It's just. Yeah. It's just, it's just, what he's doing is just so wonderful. It is, man. That was so powerful. Well, I'm really excited to hear more of your story and get our folks a chance to hear all that you're doing, you know, because we got to be out there when we did sort of our associations gathering. We got to be in your church, and I would like to say we had lots of meetings, but it feels like what we did was mostly eat. (laughs) Yeah. And then have some meetings on the side. It was like it was like the best food ever. And interesting thing, I think I actually brought you up when I was with Ruben. The Chinese food that we had in Mexicali was magnificent. Have you been down there to, to get across the border and see all that's happening there? I've been to El Centro, but I, I haven't been to Mexicali. And I've heard about the Chinese food there, but ne- never, never um, had it yet. Oh man, see, see, I, I was hoping you had so you could give me like a, like an expert review. But so when you get to go, we'll, we'll have to talk about it again because I'm really curious to hear what you think of it. But, but I'd love to hear some of your story, Dennis. And then, of course, I'm sure we'll land somewhere around what you're excited about for the association and uh, how you're leading in that. But tell me a little bit about where you were born, grew up, what kind of life was like for little Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I grew up in New Jersey. Both of my parents immigrated from Hong Kong. You know, grew up in an immigrant family. They worked really hard to provide for us. And my dad, when I was about eight or nine years old, he had a radical encounter with the Lord in his bedroom and uh, just had an encounter with Holy Spirit. Got radically saved that day, that night. Mm. His life was completely transformed. Even as an eight, nine-year-old, I could clearly tell the difference in him. He started going to church, um, engaging with us differently, leading us in Bible study, et cetera. And our whole family got baptized together, except for my little brother, who wasn't old enough at the time. But we clearly saw wow. the change in my dad. 
Um, and we just started walking with the Lord. So I have been um, a Christian since I was eight, nine years old and mm. truly gave my life to Jesus after seeing the transformation of my dad. So what, had he been around believers? Was he like reading the Bible? Did he just like literally out of nowhere, God appears in his room or was there some kind of well, he, seeking he, before that? He grew up in the church, you know, in okay. Hong Kong. Um, but, you know, he would say, you know, he was just kind of not really truly walking with God and mm. got busy with his career. At the time, he was sure. building a house for us in, um, in New Jersey and just focused on his career as an engineer. And, um, and he was just having a conversation with my mom about God. God just touched him. He's not, he's not an emotional man. He got extremely emotional just in his bedroom and just changed from that day forward, which really changed wow. the trajectory of our whole family. Yeah, I would say. So yeah. eight, nine years old. And yeah, you, you said you had siblings. How many siblings do you have? I have an older sister and a younger brother. Oh, okay. Cool. That's cool. Okay, so then you're growing up in Jersey. So we you're in church. Were you in a Chinese church? Yeah, we were going to a Chinese church. And I, I, I want to really honor that church because I feel like they laid a really great foundation for me. Mm. Um, and I think they're a great church and they still are today. Yeah. But I, I do share with people that growing up in an immigrant church, in an Asian ethnic church, sometimes as a young, young person who's really trying to pursue my faith, it can be disillusioning and confusing because mm. there's a certain culture that's in the church that as soon as you walk outside the doors of the church, you're just engaging in mainstream America. When you come into the church, there's all of the, the Chinese culture, the Chinese language, mm. the Chinese way of doing things. And so it was kind of disillusioning for, for me as a young person. And I found out there's, there's actually a sociological term and phenomenon that describes how young people engage the Asian ethnic church, and it's called the silent exodus. So what yeah. happens in Asian ethnic churches is a lot of the young people leave the church um, when they graduate high school, maybe even leave the faith altogether. So the statistic in American churches is they lose 60% of young people when they go off to college, which is, you know, that's not a good statistic at all in, in general. But the statistic amongst Chinese churches goes all the way up to 90%. Wow. And I, yes. And I can attest to that because I was one of that 90%. When I went off to college to Cornell University, upstate New York, I made a conscious decision to leave the Asian ethnic church and mm. just feeling like, kind of burned out on how things work at Asian ethnic churches. And that's when I found the vineyard. And then I went through this deep renewal experience. So we, there was a church that was planted, Ithaca Vineyard was planted out of the Syracuse Vineyard. And so I joined the Ithaca Vineyard when it was just first starting to get planted. And I had a radical transformation, just filled with the Holy Spirit, dramatic transformation. Mm. And God had been speaking to me about a call to ministry even before that. But it was at the vineyard that I really, that God really solidified my calling, and renewed my faith, and renewed my passion for Jesus and His kingdom. And mm. um, and so, what's interesting? So I had left the Asian ethnic church, and I was 20 years old when I joined the vineyard in 1998. But I, I felt like that the Lord spoke to me very early on, like very early on, like right as soon as I joined the vineyard and had that renewal experience. I want you to pioneer Asian American ministry in the vineyard. Wow. And to be honest with you, Jay, I, I, I was not really that excited about that calling at that time. Yeah, how would I do that? Right, yeah. And, and I just left the Asian ethnic church. You know, right, right, so on solution. purpose, and, right. Yeah, right. and so, um, so, so, you know, God had spoken that um, to me, though, and I just kind of, you know, just kind of put it away in my heart. And then that summer, I, I went out to the National Conference, the 1999 National Conference mm. out in Anaheim. So I was working a summer job in... New Jersey, took a week off, went out with the two pastors that were planting the Ithaca Vineyard to the National Conference. And I have what I call a, uh, a divine appointment with Kenneth Kwan. Like he, I mm. literally, you know, the Anaheim Vineyard is like thousands of people. And I felt like Holy Spirit said, go talk to that guy across mm. the auditorium. And um, I kind of ignored it a couple of times, but the prompting just kept getting stronger and I ended up approaching the guy that turned out to be Kenneth's associate pastor. And then I ended up meeting Kenneth and then Lo and behold, he had the same exact calling. It's like, you know, God called me when I came into the vineyard to pioneer Asian American ministry. So, wow. you know, we connected more. Um, and then he invited me out to do an internship after college for two years. So the plan was to go to Fuller Seminary, do an internship with the youth at his church. Um, ended up marrying his daughter. And, um, and then, you know, we've been together almost 22 years. 
Wow. Okay, wait. So back up because I want to I want to understand a little bit more of the sort of dynamic because you said a bunch of things that were really interesting that I think I know just from knowing you and we've had some conversations about this, but I think it would be helpful to think through a minute. When you say that people are leaving, so you said it's 60 percent in just, you know, run of the mill church in America, 90 percent in specifically Chinese churches, people leaving as they go to college or they grow up. I think I heard you say it, but it's really what you're describing is it's almost feels like two alternate universes. So it's like yes. I'm in this church and it's great. Maybe it was great. I mean, growing in my life with Jesus, it seems to make sense of how my family works. But then when I leave and I go to college or I start a career, it seems too disconnected from the rest of my life. Like, I, I can't just stay in this. I can't keep going. Whether that's right or not, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making a statement about that. I'm just, what do you think is the, is that really what the impetus is? What's the impetus for people going, I, I just can't continue yeah. like this? I think young people, even when they're at home, even before they leave for college, they're feeling very disconnected. The term mm -hmm. that we use is that they feel like second-class citizens. Like this church mm -hmm. was built and made for people that were born overseas, that are in America, we're going to speak the, the native language, we're going right. to, you, you know, you can come here and experience the culture and, and, and experience the Asian culture and not have to deal with all the pressures of American society and all the hardships that you've had as an immigrant. And so the churches were primarily planted and geared for that group. So when you mm -hmm. have a, a next generation person that was born in America, has been engaging in the in mainstream America, um, might be going to school in, in America, raised in America, they're going to feel a disconnect with how things are run in that church. Right. Right. So that's that. So it's like, happened. it sounds like what you're saying is for the, the folks who the church was planted for and the people that are in the original church plant, it creates like a safe haven for them. Right. Like, right. man, this helps us to remember what it's like to be home to feel connected to our identity. But then if you've not been, you know, you've been raised now in the U.S., it doesn't have that same sense of home. Therefore, when you're kind of growing up and you get to make your own choices, you're like, I'm going to figure out how to do this a different way. So for you, Dennis, would you say when you look back, man, I really was in love with the Lord. My life with God was really working. Or was it kind of like, nah, it was a little confusing even then yeah i think that the lord was working in my life i think i was trying my best to love god and, and grow closer to god but mm. i think i i honestly and i and i'm not unique i think a lot of people that grew up in asian ethnic churches when i share my story lots of them resonate with this but just feeling a disconnect with the right. everyday ministry in an asian ethnic church and feeling mm. like that you know this church is not necessarily for me or not necessarily geared for me, for, for me to thrive in my walk with right. God. Um, so that's what kind of happened. And I, I feel like that that resonates with a lot of Asian American young people. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, and you know, so as you know, because we talked about this before, we've helped in our city in Denver plant some Burmese churches. Of course, I see the same with immigrant populations of churches in our city that are maybe Spanish speaking churches that it, you know, Ruben and I have had similar conversations. This is a real dynamic that people have from churches that were planted by immigrants, first-generation immigrants, and then they're looking at their kids and going, I don't know, I'm not sure what to do. And like you said, when they go to college, they get to make their own decisions. But what's encouraging about you is your faith was intact enough that you said, you know, I got to find, let me find a church. And that's how you stumble into the vineyard. So tell me about, like, why the vineyard? Why, when you go to the Ithaca Vineyard, are you like, man, this is my church? So, you know, we we drove, um, John Elmer was a his pastor at the Syracuse Vineyard. I know he's mm -hmm. transitioning to SRL, but um, yeah, planted that church. And we drove the college students that were planting the Ithaca Vineyard. We drove an hour and a half each direction to, uh, to go one and a half hours up to the church, have service, and then we drive back. I, by the way, I told John Elmer, he, owe, he owes me a medal. I think I'm the, you know, the, <laughs> the longest distance to go to this church. Well, he just told me 
that he had this conversation with you and he had to admit to you he didn't even realize that. He was like, what? Oh. I was like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, actually, at times he would actually come down and just speak at our campus too. Right, um, right. So, but but yeah, so, you know, so driving, <laughs> but but here, here's the thing. When we dro- dro- drove an hour and a half to the Syracuse Vineyard, there was an encounter that I had every mm. single time. In right. worship. And I, I know this, my story here is not unique to me. It's like most vineyard folks have the same stories, but that was the reason why we were driving an hour and a half to drive mm-hmm. the service where, you know, especially being in a place like Cornell where academics was, you know, uh, such something that was so taken so seriously to yeah. spend three hours on a Sunday, just driving back and forth to church. But there was something of a deposit that was happening. And mm. a deep renewal, like I said, that 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 happened for me because I was getting honestly burnt out with like religion and Christianity and the Asian ethnic church, and it's very disillusioning. And I don't really feel like I fit in. And and then but then going to uh, and and I'm feeling like I was called to the ministry. It's like okay, yeah. I'm not really excited about this, you know, if it's going to be like this, and I'm navigating all of these layers of culture, et cetera. So going to the Syracuse Vineyard and driving an hour and a half, there was just uh, an encounter with God that was happening every single time. But like how, what, what in the world made you go that first time then? Like somebody already was going there or they knew about the vineyard or that seems so wild to me that, because there's churches around where you are, I assume, but somebody's yeah. like, we got to go to this church. So, you know, back in those days, this was like the, the late 90s. Um, vineyard worship was very, very popular. So we, mm-hmm. we had been listening to like vineyard cassette tapes. That was already having a profound impact on me, even though I was coming from a more conservative background. But we right. were listening to the vineyard worship that was already having kind of a renewal in, at, at, a, at a heart level. And so I guess that's what kind of drew me in. Like, okay, then we, I found out that there's a vineyard that's starting up at, at Cornell. Mm. Okay, you know, go and check it out. And then when I went to check it out, then it was like, even deeper renewal, deeper work of God in my heart. So the, it was, I guess it was the, the answer to your question, it was the vineyard worship. That, so worship, you'd known of the vineyard. Right. You're like, I guess I'm going to this. And you had a little crew that would go with you. Our, our little group, our little group of like 13 college students. Was wow. The group that, that really started that church. That, that church is doing well today. And it was started with 13 college students and, and the pastor. So wait, 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 hold on, hold on. So you're going up there. Then someone's like, "We should plant a church in Ithaca. Why are we driving up there?" Well, they didn't. Well, it, it, the conversation had already started. That process had already started. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. I was like, "Okay," and then and then we kind of engaged. So, it, it, the, I mean, a little bit of that what you're saying, but it was the conversation had already begun. Okay, and so then you're also a part of the church plant. That's right. Yeah, we planted the church. Yeah, the 13 college students and then the pastor. And what was that like? How were you mean you just went from a small group to a church plant? How did you were that still in great, school? Yeah, we were all still in school, obviously. And we just wow. we did everything. Like literally the college students were like the board members of the church, <laughs> even worship, ushers, you know, we had this uh, uh breakfast donut ministry. We 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 would pick up people for church too, and, and like driving around in the snow, I still remember. So yeah, I mean the college students did everything. So you guys just decide we're gonna launch a service with this pastor. Who what was who's the pastor that planted Bob the Wilson. church? Bob Wilson's his name. So Bob Wilson, thirteen college students, and whoever else he probably had around are like, okay, let's start a church. And you're just like showing up, serving, picking people up, doing all the things while going to school, and what I assume was a pretty rigorous academic experience. I mean, Cornell is not, you know, that's no slouch. So when you think back, it, what's so interesting to me listening to you say that is how many, I mean, even listening right now, there could be people in college that are going, yeah, you know, there's not really a vineyard near here, or, you know, me and my friends, we drive, whatever, two hours to this other vineyard church that we care about. But somewhere in there, God saw fit for you to not just go to college, but to be a church planning team. That is so cool to think that you're like, yeah, let's do that on top of all this. Yeah, and really, when when I think, back on it, it's really by God's grace. And I think that, you know, he saw these college students that were just giving it their best. You know, I I was listening to the John Elmer podcast that that you guys recorded and and like listening to his story and how it all started with, uh, with the priest and, 
you know, just yeah. trusting him with a small group. And I, I just feel like that's a similar story that we all carry, right? We were just trying to do our best. We we're probably messing up along the way. But sure. I think God honors it. And we're like, we're going to do our best to honor God and build this kingdom. And we don't really know what we're doing entirely. We don't necessarily have all the best tools, but we're going to go for it. And and like when I think back now and, and knowing what's happening at the Ithaca Vineyard these days and knowing how it started, I think it's just God's grace and how he loves it that we just go for, or like, you know, our slogan in the vineyard, everyone gets to play and yeah. we're just going for it. And I think there's just tremendous power in that, the power of God's spirit in us just going after it. What a miracle. So you're a part of all of that. And what were you, what were you studying at Cornell? Well, I was studying a bunch of things because I was uh, really wrestling with my calling. So I, I majored in economics, minored in computer science, and I was pre-med. <laughs> yeah, but, but I just want to clarify, I didn't succeed in any of them. I was doing too much, and ultimately God was calling me to the ministry. So. Dude, that is amazing. That is so many things. Like, but you, but you had this thing in the back of your mind. Like, I think I'm supposed to do ministry. So you push through all those things, you get your degree or degrees, I don't know. And then and then that's when you do the internship? Right. So a little bit of the backstories to all that is that yeah. I would say there's a lot of pressure on me, societal pressure or Asian American pressure of like yes. you know, my what my ancestors did to get here, to get me here, to get me in, you know into an Ivy League school with an opportunity right. to succeed. And I really wrestled with my call to ministry. You know, I always thought of my grandfather, who who had a really hard hard time in America, got drafted to um, to the American Army in World War II when when his wife had just passed away, and like mm. just all the hardships that he faced, um, just trying to you know have, start a laundromat business in New York City. And I, I think, you know, I'm trying to honor him and the, his legacy, but like also at the same time honored God's calling that I felt like yeah. He was speaking to me. So that's a little bit of the backstory. Why did I? try all those majors and all the, those studies and but ended up going through that renewal experience in, in the through the vineyard that that's what propelled me and compelled me to the take the next step to answer my call to God. okay so tell me tell me a little about that if you could so when you say renewal experience do you mean like over a period of time like there were renewal experiences and that was in a new experience or was there like a specific point in time where you're like God it was pretty quick me. it was pretty quick I mean, so, so tell when, me about that. I mean, I, it's it's really hard to explain, really, but it, it was like just going to the Syracuse Vineyard or the even the worship times and the gatherings that we had in Ithaca as we planted the mm. church. Knowing that God is real, knowing that He's working in this group, and that He's clearly working mm. in me, that He loves me, is pouring His Spirit into me, and mm. that just renewed my call. Like you know, I, I'd already been thinking or I feeling like God was calling ministry, but kind of maybe pushing it down or ignoring it and trying to answer the other pressures that were um, more you know family related or society related. But going through that time of of God pouring out His Spirit on me in the times of worship, especially in those in those early days joining the vineyard, that's what really transformed me and propelled me to answer the call to the ministry. Mm. So in environments of worship, you're just experiencing the presence of God. Yes. And that's making you go, I think there's this other thing that I'm made for. Yes. Wow. That's so cool. And so then you go to Anaheim, then you meet Pastor Kenneth, then it's like, hey, do an internship with me. So you just go from, I mean, you're an East Coast kid. You go from... Ithaca, you graduate, you do whatever you finish up there, and you just, boom, you show up in L.A. I prayed to God. I said, God, I'm ready to answer your call. You got to give me the right open door. And mm -hmm. I had that, what I call a divine appointment with, uh, with Kenneth Kwan. And uh, after two weeks after graduation, I packed two suitcases, one-way ticket. I remember walking through LAX with my two suitcases and just sensing God saying, Dennis, I'm proud of you. Wow, and uh, and you know a little bit emotional just sharing that. Just but it was it was you know me answering the call that I felt like that God had placed in my life and and to do what you know He had created me for. So. Wow, that's amazing. So then you you're now in some internship. Did, did you live with 
But where did you live? So I was living over at uh, close to Fuller in Pasadena. Okay. And I was trying to start the degree at Fuller while doing the youth internship, working with the youth. Ah, at, uh, okay. Yep. Yo. So you're doing youth, you're going to Fuller, chasing this thing around. You still have this thing from the back of your mind when you're first in the vineyard of like, I'm going to help do Asian American ministry in the vineyard. So tell me how you go from an internship into the moments you're in now. I mean, cause now you're, yeah, you're doing all this. <laughs> you're no. leading. I, I would, you know, I would say in humility, I was just trying to be faithful and just leading mm -hmm. that youth group, but that youth group turned into um, an English service for the church. And mm -hmm. we started, it was junior high, high schoolers. And we added some. Wait, so, so why did it be, it, so you're in a Chinese speaking vineyard Mm -hmm. that then because you're leading the youth, it's sort of like a continuation of what you experienced before. Right. Where now you're ministering to yourself in a certain mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you're carrying those experiences with you and you're going, why don't we just do an English service to sort of build a bridge? Let's try this. Right. Right. Fascinating. Okay. And so we just keep building it with, you know, college students, then over time, then young adults and, you know, just um, and then as as that all took shape, then that's when uh, you know I became I went full time and just on and on and just continue to try to stay faithful to what God was calling our particular local church to do. But the whole time, you know, Kenneth and I would always be talking, and we'd be talking about exactly we'd be talking about the silent exodus and how we, we can't let that happen in this church. Like, how do we empower the next generation? Something mm. very beautiful about Kenneth is that he's very empowering. Mm. Um, he listens really well. And so he was hearing all these things about, and, and he saw it too. I mean, he saw it with his friends in their churches, losing the next generation. So he made big sacrifices to do things differently in our church. Mm. And so like, so, so on May 1st, you know, I don't know when this podcast will be released, but on May 1st is going to be the official transition for me to become the solo lead pastor of the overall church. Wow. And, and Jay, you should know, this doesn't happen in Asian ethnic churches. Asian mm. ethnic churches for the 150 years, or I, I can speak for the Chinese uh, Chinese immigrant churches, the 150 years of history of Chinese immigrant churches, they just keep on repeating the cycle, right? This church right. made immigrants, you know, to create the culture and the church for immigrants. They lose the next generation. Then there's a new generation of immigrants and they just keep on repeating the cycle. But Kenneth is, is such an astute leader and so empowering and so loves the next generation. They said, we, we have to do something different in order to minister to the next generation so that the next generation can be empowered and have a platform to minister to the, even the next generation. And so that's why we're making this transition right now, which has been literally a six-year process, literally lots and lots of steps, literally lots and lots of cultural conflict, hard conversations. We're finally here at this kind of last step of this uh, transition. So I hope that we're going to be able to set a model yeah. And uh, be able to like help other immigrant churches to not repeat the cycle with the silent exodus. So that's our hope. That's our vision is to mm. be able to do this successfully, but then also be able to have uh, an opportunity to help other Asian ethnic churches do the same thing and, um, and minister well to the next generation. Yeah, because it's interesting. So again, just to hear the timeline, when you show up as an intern, it's a Chinese speaking vineyard church. Right. Pretty much. So, other than the kids, yeah. Okay, other than the kids. But the same phenomenon you're describing. So now you're doing youth, which means, ah, oh, I should do something in English. I'm going to do an English speaking deal. But then as those kids get older, now it's sort of like young adults, youth, middle school, English speaking. And of course, as that continues, did that sort of become like a second service almost? Like they were almost like a church inside of a church of like. Exactly. exactly. So that church inside of a church kind of keeps growing while the other church is there. And then they're kind of interlocking here and there because it's family. And that's going up until, you know, he and you both say, you know, it seems like it would make the most sense for you to lead, to transition this church into a new reality. So as it has a new reality, will it still have... Chinese speaking and English services? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Especially so that, that, that all continues. That's okay. Right. 
I mean, especially the area that we live in, right? right. It's like 65% Asian, lots of immigrants are still coming mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still need to reach out. I mean, we would be foolish not to. Um, right. Th th uh, this is this is the demographic here in, in our, our area. So uh, yes, definitely we're going to keep on reaching out to the Chinese speaking as well. So in one sense, there was a clear vision and picture from God for like, we need to minister throughout the vineyard and or we have a Chinese speaking church that this sort of English service is building up. Instead of it being an exodus, we're going to keep these folks in the church as they're growing older by kind of creating this church in a church, and then those things are blending together. So, in one sense, it was like God had given you a vision for it, but then it doesn't sound, I mean, I, I, I hate to say it was sort of accidental, but it, it was sort of the next natural step as you were leading as a youth group leader. Right. For those, for that to just sort of form within the church. So, let me just ask it differently. Why do you think that isn't happening in most Chinese speaking churches? Why, why isn't it creating an, uh, an English speaking service for youth? And, you know, it, that, what you're describing sounds very natural to me. Yeah. Like it would make sense to do that. What do you think the challenges are? Why, why does that not happen? Because you mentioned lots of cultural conversations, there's conflict and awkward things. So is that really why? Is it like that just is too hard to figure out? Or what, what do you think is going on? Honestly, I think it's power dynamics. I mean, I think that, mm. that, that most churches don't have a Kenneth Kwan that loves mm. the next generation, that's going to make the sacrifices, that's going to be empowering, mm. that's going to put his neck out on the line to keep on ministering to the next generation and the youth. I think that's a big limiting factor. Lots of Asian ethnic churches, I would say they care about the next generation, but uh, it's one thing that, to say it, and it's another thing to really put yourself on the line and make sacrifices in order to make it happen. I mean, Kenneth, I mean, he's going to stay on and it's be a part of our executive team. He'll still minister to the Chinese ministry, but of course, he needs to, he has to humble himself, right? And to, 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 it takes a very humble man, um, one who is very secure about himself too, and his calling to do what he's doing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I. Just, I, I can't say enough how grateful I am for him and admire him for the steps that he's taking. Mm. Truly care about the next generation and to sacrifice himself. Every month on the We Are Vineyard podcast, we introduce a new book or recommended resource to dig in deeper. For May, we're recommending that everyone reads Miracle Work by Jordan Sang. Later this month, we'll interview Jordan to hear a deeper dive on his book and much more. Miracle Work is available through Vineyard Resources and wherever books are sold. In one sense, every transition involves the things you're describing, right? So forget about Chinese Vineyard Church, forget about, China, you know, whatever, at all the ethnic complications. If you're just trying to transition a church, that you're, it's what you're describing. You know, a pastor has to be able to trust upcoming leaders and begin to give away. And so that's all hard. What you're describing is the added complication of what really is sort of a cultural shift, too, where it's like, so now we're not just solely defined by an immigrant experience. That's right. So talk a little bit about that. What are the sort of, because you've, you've mentioned, and you don't have to go into great detail. I mean, I know these things are still fresh, whatever, but what are some of the hurdles, the conversations you've had to have, the, the awkward realizations? What, what kinds of things has that required? So the terminology we often say in Asian ethnic churches that the English speaking young people will feel like second-class citizens, right? This church mm. was built for the people that are from overseas, the immigrant population. 
right now where uh, people could feel like we're reversing that. Right. Right. So, so we, you've got an English speaking lead pastor coming into place who doesn't speak much Chinese, right? Doesn't obviously doesn't understand the immigrant culture necessarily, or at least doesn't have the personal experience or direct yes. personal experience. And so they're feeling everything has slipped over and that's very real. And there's been some really intense, heavy conversations around that. Hmm. So I would say that's a big challenge that we have been navigating. And I think, I think we're going to have to keep on navigating that. Right. Cause like th- right yeah. now it's all, right now it's all theory. Right. And we've, shared with the division forward, but come May 1st, I think we're going to have to demonstrate that we yeah. truly care and we truly have a vision forward and we're taking steps to minister to the Chinese speaking or the Asian ethnic, Asian immigrant population. Mm. But then it isn't just like the language changes, right? I mean, there's all the dynamics of, it's not just new leaders are in the room. I mean, it's, it's I'm sure it's going to feel different. Like, That's right. I mean, so many dynamics of displacement and change and so many things. I mean, like just like one example that people yeah. you know, think, like we're 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 doing a rebrand. So we redid the, like the website and even just the website and the colors on the website, mm. right? Is there's different approaches and different values of different colors within the culture. Mm. Right. And so like even our, like the, we were just talking about the very front page of the website and the colors that were there. At first, it was like more black and white. But in right. the Asian culture, you know, black and white means a certain thing. And, right. uh, and, and so, you know, we need to adjust that. So like there's many, many layers that we're navigating in terms of the culture. Oh, I can't imagine. And when you think about the strengths and the beauty and the power and the sort of contribution. Of course, these are stereotypes. So stereotypes are dangerous, but sometimes they can be helpful. But when you think about the strengths of the Chinese church and these sort of churches that have been formed all through the U.S. and the sort of gift to the body of Christ and or sort of the strengths that are brought forward, what do you think are the unique strengths that are brought forward from, you know, even just the heritage of this church or churches like this? One very clear strength, and it's very interesting because I was just talking to some of the other Asian leaders in the vineyard about it today. Mm. The Mm. one very key strength that the Asian culture is the community and the Mm. family dynamic that happens in churches. So Asian immigrant churches almost always have lunch together. It's a community lunch every single week. You know, I can't tell you how many countless staff meetings we talk through all of the details of the lunch you know, and figuring out the lunch and making sure the lunch, you know, goes well and how to do that for like several hundred people, you know, yeah. every single week. But it's so important. But then I find that, that that is something that's very, very beautiful about the Asian immigrant churches, Asian ethnic churches, right? They, they, they've done a fantastic job of hospitality and warmth and welcome and community and building in the, mm. the family dynamic into the into the overall church. And that's something that I think we need to really uphold. And, and I, I feel that value that's just even in my local church, you know, and so I, I hope that we can keep, continue that, or I intend to, you know, and that's something that's embedded into the culture of the Asian ethnic population that I think we need to, not just for us, but hopefully for the broader, you know, American, population could really yes. clean that from the Asian ethnic culture. Yeah. No. That that's that is that is a huge contribution. I'm I'm always struck too with my brothers and sisters that lead in the Chinese churches I know across the country that is cultural, the embedded sense of honor, respect, yes. care for elders. Yes. That is genuine. You know, it's like this is this the way that the world is intended to be, to be genuinely honoring, supportive, strengthening, which is something that in, a, in sort of just broader, what would just be American culture at this point, frankly, is sort of missing. Yes. Um, there's a gap there for understanding the honor of family and just elders. I see that so clearly when I'm with my Chinese brothers and sisters. 
how do you think? I mean, so say more about that. I mean, do you, you're you're saying yes. I mean, I just see that. Do do when you look at like American churches and way, even people talk about pastors or two pastors or do the, about their parents, their family. Yeah, I you know we were just talking about it in our cohort today the mm. Asian Vineyard pastors, and we're saying that when people of the older generation come and visit our church churches, so not just mine, but the cohort that, that the word of pastoring in the vineyard, yeah, it, it just seems like they feel more honored and more yeah. valued. And I think that there's a real opportunity there for us as we grab a hold of that piece of our culture that we are able to honor, you know, the people that have gone before us, not just in the age, but people that are just you know, that have, that, that have invested for, for many years, you know, in church or in the vineyard or, you know, what, or whatever the case may be. I think that if we're, we're able to tap into that piece of the culture, that's kingdom. Right? That's actually a kingdom value, but something yeah. that has been more embedded into the Asian culture yes. that I think can bring it forth even more. And so what do you think when you look at sort of some of those ethnic distinctions and things you're trying to figure out, where do you find there's hurdles where you're like, Man, we, we have sort of an embedded culture that I think the kingdom is challenging, you know, that we need to receive or respond or think differently as we're helping kind of our church grow and develop and become a kingdom community. So those are strengths. Do you see weaknesses as well? You know, I would say every strength could also potentially be a weakness. Ah, right. So even the honor part, sometimes we've dealt with this many, many, many times, you know, in my local church context of honoring the ones that came before, honoring the elders. But as we're doing that, are we also empowering the younger people? Are they mm. also empowering the younger people or are we just oh, trying to honor, right? And so that's something that, right. that's a tension that we have been grappling with for a long time, right? Yeah. And then like, and then in the, in the Asian culture, there's a thing about, especially about saving face. So we're, yes. so we're trying to honor so that people can save face, but then are we doing that um, at the expense of maybe telling the truth or really speaking the truth or, you know, releasing the next generation um, into their destiny at the same time? So I feel like that's the tension that we need to grapple with. Mm, that's good. Well, and it, and it speaks again, like you're saying, to Pastor Kenneth's thoughtfulness and intention that that strikes so differently compared to like you're saying, so many other churches that you've known, that that's a real gift for him to be willing to do that in humility is remarkable. No, that's good. That's, that's, those are really helpful thoughts and will continue to be challenges, I'm sure, as we think about the whole vineyard. So talk a little bit about what you're excited about by way of this uh, association. I mean, I'm so, honestly, Dennis, I'm so grateful that you were willing to lead to this end. I know that you believe that God's called you and you're responding to the call of God, but, you know, I'm just so excited about the things that God's putting in your heart for the vineyard as a whole and specifically the associate. I'd just love for, to hear you talk a little bit about what you're excited about and Man, what you're I'm, looking forward I'm to. I'm so thankful, so excited. Like when you, you called me last year, like, I don't know, I, I think when you first became, were, were ratified. Yeah, right away. I think right almost there. immediately. Yeah. I remember when you called me, and you said, uh, hey, I want to work together and with these associations. I literally started crying on the phone. And I said, mm -hmm. that, I said to you, man, I've been waiting for this phone call for 23 years. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've been feeling like God's been calling me to this. And I just see that this is, you know, God's timing. You know, when we started engaging just with uh, Asian Americans in the vineyard, like at the national conference in October, we had this meeting under the tent. I think we had 50 to 75 people there. And we were just meeting each other for the first time. This is, these are Asian Americans that have been in the vineyard for like more than a decade, right? Some of us were like, how long have you been in the vineyard? Like, oh, 15 years, 20 years. And we'd never met each other, you know? Yeah. And just to meet each other and just to be engaging one another, just to have conversation together, just to share stories or share common Asian American experiences or Asian American vineyard experiences, that in itself has been so great so impactful, so healing, so helpful, mm. um, so kingdom. So we're really, really thankful for that. But then pressing more into the piece of like Asian American Christian identity or Asian American vineyard identity. And what does that mm. mean? What does that look like for the future 
of worship, of church planting, of um, other expressions of, of, of the faith. And, and so engaging in those conversations with the association, I mean, and we're only at the beginning stage, right? This has only been yeah. the last couple of months, but it's been just so wonderful, so life-giving. And there's so many people in the vineyard I didn't, I didn't even know are so passionate about this piece, right? Mm. And so we're, we're actually linking up together these days, and it's just been great. Like, like um, there's a guy named Spencer Lee from the North Jersey Vineyard, Harvard grad, um, helped us to pioneer Asian American studies at Harvard, you know, back wow. in the day. And who knew he was, you know, an editor at one of the major Asian American publications, super smart, super engaged. And we've recently been connecting. And I think that uh, the association model has been just helpful to get us connected, get us working together, to get us thinking together, dreaming together um, for the future. So I, I'm just, you know, super, super excited. Oh, man. No, that's really fun. Yeah. And I've got like, I mean, even in that tent in Phoenix, that was so powerful i mean it just felt as though the lord was with us in a very special way you know there is a way that people talk about these kinds of things that it's really centered in social dynamics and it's important to think about social dynamics but it's also true that this is what the holy spirit's doing like the holy spirit is bringing together people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to be his people. And in the vineyard, it just seems like it's in its right time. We can always say about what we could have been or should have been or might have been, whatever. You know, we'll have to explore all those things because there are conversations to be had. But it's also true that there are t ways that God just does things in times and seasons, and it just seems as though this is what the Holy Spirit's doing in raising up leaders, drawing these things to our attention. So when you start to think about the vineyard as a whole, okay, so you're leading in a church that's in a transition from being a Chinese-speaking church to all the different things we've talked about. And, and by the way, how long is that church was how long ago was the church planted? It was planted in 1991. So we just celebrated our 30th anniversary. So 30 years. And this is something that I don't think people realize when they think about the vineyard. There are little pockets of interesting vineyard churches all across the country that people aren't totally unaware of. Like, that means we've had a Chinese speaking church in the vineyard for 30 years. Yes. So this isn't just like, a, oh, we thought about this this year or something kind of thing. <laughs> this is like, you know, 30 years ago. My goodness. Again, like the, there's been movements of what God's been doing in these different arenas for a long time. But when you think about across the country, how are you thinking about what it looks like for the vineyard? Not just to sort of pull together folks who maybe... Uh, Asian Americans, which is huge to be able to help people feel a sense of home. What do you imagine? What are you thinking about when you think about the vineyard as a whole? So what's beautiful about the association model is that we're doing this together with the other associations. Yes. We have, we have monthly gatherings, and we just talked about this just at our last meeting of hmm. what it's going to look like and what are the steps forward for us to work together. Yep. Right? And it's not just it's not just silos of, OK, here's what the Asian Americans are doing or here's what the African-American leaders are doing. Yep. But what are we doing together uh, collectively mm -hmm. to become more diverse, to speak into pieces in the vineyard that we know, you know, could change or become improved, to become better, to be more inclusive. Yeah. But we need to raise our voice together and be able to work together. And so, like, it's it's been really beautiful. Like, like my connection with Ruben, I think it's just so wonderful and beautiful mm. of and there's a whole story to that of how we got connected. But I think that that's really key because just even between the Asian American community and the Hispanic community, honestly, you know, there, there has been tension historically, right? right. And, and, if, if, we, and if, if me and Ruben can work together at a personal level, but then also at a local church level, but then also broader as an, at an association level, yes, I think that's when the kingdom of God's gonna break in. And I tell people it, it'll be in the vineyard and it'll be beyond the vineyard if we are able to find a way that we can collaborate and, and collectively um, discern God and worship together and see God's kingdom together. And I could not agree with you more, Dennis. I mean, I think what makes me excited about the moment we're in is we have an opportunity in that we're creating 
sort of a lab, so to speak, amongst these associations where, and I've said this to you, I've said this amongst our groups and our leaders, if within these kind of association leaders and or core groups, if amongst us, along with our overall leadership team, our national team, we learn how to work together, build initiatives and frameworks for how we're imagining and envisioning the vineyard together, and we can find a way to do that fully authentically with who we are all together. My faith that we become a diverse movement that represents the fullness of God's kingdom is revealed in Revelation, God's desire for every tribe, tongue, and nation. If we can do that amongst us, like brothers and sisters, and that might include some conflict, that'll include some misunderstanding, that'll include some strengths that are brought to bear that maybe we didn't know how to experience as we were talking about a moment ago. My confidence that that becomes the whole of the vineyard goes way up because we've been learning how to do it amongst ourselves Amen. in this environment. Too often for me, I mean, even listening to you, these conversations live only in the public square. So it becomes a Facebook argument. You know, it becomes, you know, we, we read a book or we attend a seminar or maybe even we just like give an inspiring sermon about every t tribe, tongue, and nation, you know, or whatever. When, you know, the real work happens face-to-face, -face, over meals, talking about our stories and the places where we feel aligned and where we feel misaligned or we feel misunderstood or confused or hurt. And that when we have those perspectives amongst one another, like in a in genuine relationship and connection to another. And then we can bring those representations to our various groups, you know, like, you know, for you to be able to say to the cohorts and the folks that you're working with, man, I'm really excited about what we're doing as a vineyard. And we're a part of this. This is us. If we can find our way through that, which is not an easy thing. Josh Williams, who I know you know well, said to me, he said, Jay, you're not mapping out a plan for diversity, he said, you're mapping on a plan to heal America. Mm, amen. Like if there's a way that churches figure out how to do this, exactly what you said a mo moment ago, Dennis, that, that radiates not just through the vineyard, but through the body of Christ in our cities, across the country, and really around the world. You know, I, what struck me also being with uh, Ruben was when he was like, yeah, we should partner with the Mexico ABC, as we think about Spanish-speaking churches, because, man, they could help train us in a bunch of their churches, and what if they helped us plant churches into the U.S.? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, all of these little components on how missions work and cross-cultural missions and even what you're describing in developing youth, so many things get kind of roped in together. It's it's genuinely encouraging. It's genuinely inspiring. Brings hope. Amen. Awesome. <laughs> it's so <laughs> exciting. Yes. So, so you have some things you're trying to pull together, right? Is you're trying to lead forward. I, I, I think you have a, an event on the calendar. You have some things you're trying to, trying to get going. Yeah. We have an Asian American summit at my church in Los Angeles, November 10th to the 12th. Mm. I'm promising everyone the best Asian food that they can Ooh, have. Oh, big promise. Asia. Yes. <laughs> outside of Asia, he says. We can yeah. deliver. <laughs> okay, that's good. And what do you imagine? What? Tell me about what that is. Like what, you why know, Why would people come? What What are you imagining? Yeah, I, I think you're the one that said it before, not in this conversation, but previously. We're not seeing a major inflow of young Asian American leaders into the vineyard. They're not coming necessarily to our national conferences. Right. And I, I think they will one day. I actually have vision for that. But um, but I think an Asian American summit is a great opportunity where we can gather those who we're connected with in some ways that maybe don't have a, a denominational affiliation or are not connected into a church planting network. Mm -hmm. And we're just connecting with them and they can get to know us and we can get to know them. They can get to know the vision of the vineyard, you know, experience the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit, you know, so, like many of us did in, in, in through vineyard worship. 
And I think there's a real opportunity for us to connect with more people through the Asian American Summit. I mean, and while we also just connect with the, as I mentioned before, the, the brothers and sisters that are have been in the vineyard for a long time. And, yes. um, and we, there'll be value of just us getting to know each other more. So that's what I'm hoping for. And also, I believe that there's going to be an Asian American flavor of vineyard worship that will emerge. Mm. And we've been having actually a whole bunch of conversations about that recently. So Casey Corum, um, who I'm sure most people listening to podcasts would know, he actually has a studio in our church now. And we, so we've been having a whole bunch of conversations about Asian American worship, Asian American music in general, and then, but then Asian, what that means for Asian American worship, mm. Asian American vineyard worship. So it's it's exciting to dream about that, and then have conversations about that, and and uh, to pray into it. So, oh, that is so, that's so inspiring. That's super encouraging. Oh, I, I mean, oh man, that makes me want to ask like a hundred questions in a row because because even being at your church, being in the worship experiences and having folks that are on some of your teams lead worship. What's so fun to watch is how the values of vineyard worship do transcend across all kinds of ethnic barriers, you know? Yes. Um, you know, I've been in vineyard churches in Ethiopia, for example. And I don't know how much Ethiopian music or worship you've heard like there's like it's like lots of keyboard it's really it's really hyped up it's powerful and to hear them doing vineyard worship songs in amaric but with a different style a different flavor and them writing worship songs or hearing worship songs coming out of um chile mm. or costa rica and then to watch vineyard worship coming out of some of the germanic speaking countries it's amazing or, or nepal i was with recently the national director from nepal and hearing about some of the worship that they've been writing and building and yet all some so many of those vineyard values of authenticity genuine expectancy of god's presence we're singing god songs to god not just about god all of those things are not necessarily culturally bound and man, what it, what an exciting thought! What an exciting thought that that the diversification of worship. Yeah, I'll give you an idea, and and this okay. Is oh, I can't wait. This, this is actually Josh Williams's idea that he shared with me, but I've latched onto it. Okay, so I'm in. What if, we, what, if, what if we funded some Asian American worship leaders to mm. go back to their homeland and mm. just spend time in the city, take in the sights, the sounds, the smells, to be inspired. Because there's something about theology of place and just for yeah. them to be there, taking that in and writing music in their homeland that begins to be sung and then maybe an Asian American flavor of worship or, you know, this could be other ethnicities that that flavor of worship begins to emerge just mm. from them being in that place. Oh, that's exciting. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I like the dreams. And, you and, and you know, we're, we're probably about time. I, I also am aware, Dennis, as I listen to you, you're, you're building a path for your kids to have some models for how they can be in church. This pattern of people leaving, the 90% leaving, is being reshaped by what you're doing and what you're doing with Pastor Kenneth. And like, it's a different, it's a different day. You're creating a way that generational ministry can be passed on in these churches, which is just beyond exciting to think about your kids, to think about what the future of the vineyard becomes. This is so exciting and encouraging. Amen. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. It's so hopeful and inspiring in the midst of so many things changing so many things are difficult i mean we didn't get a chance to talk about COVID. i mean your experience of COVID. i i think that i talked to you i remember talking to you and you were telling me about COVID before any american church i knew was thinking about COVID. that's right we were definitely the first vineyard church that dropped the <laughs> attendance right because we dropped the attendance in january right as, right as COVID broke out in china and we had people yep. in our church that were from Wuhan, China, and yep. they were, you know, they're seeing their city just completely shut down. I mean, that's emotional 
right? That yeah. that was something. So so the, um, they actually there were people that stopped coming even way back in January, um, but that helped us to like stay ahead of the curve in terms of like getting all the online stuff set up earlier on. Yeah, um, you you but, had the jump on it yeah. totally. No, but I just remember that. I remember talking to you, and 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 of course, then for your church, they were it was way earlier, and they were careful a lot longer. So even That's as right. restrictions were lifting, because of the experiences of people that are from China, they saw the massive devastation. They're like, "No, nah, we're not going back to church." And I, I'll ne- I remember talking to you, and you going, "Man, we've had this huge drop. There's this virus." And and at that time, in sort of the U.S. news, it was like, "Ah." Eh, it's kind of a weird thing that's going on, I guess, but that's probably not going to affect us. And, you know, some people were a little careful, but not really. You know, it was like, eh, this is not that big a deal. So, yeah, in, in that sense, again, because of an awareness of the world that's different, your church experienced that so differently. Wow. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, Dennis, I, I'm so grateful for you making time to talk and the only thing I ask is, can I come back and talk to you some more about all this? Can we do, can we have you again sometime? I would love that. I'm really grateful, Jay, for your leadership and just for the vineyard. Just so, oh. so heartwarming what's happening. And I'm overwhelmed and just honored and thankful. Oh man, I am so excited for what the Lord is doing with us. Again, I, I, I've been talking to lots of older pastors most of them are saying they think this might be one of the hardest times to pastor that they've ever been aware of. Between COVID and the way culture's changing, the different kinds of fear, the way social media has impacted the way pastors work and online experiences. and But in the midst of all these challenges, it's guys like you that give me tons of hope, Dennis. I'm so encouraged by you, by your family, by what's going on in your church. Man, the future's really bright for what God intends to do in and with the vineyard. So thanks for all you do, man. All right. Peace to you. The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org and we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at at VineyardUSA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.